Welcome everyone, uh, good morning, and uh, thanks for coming to the session. With me I have a, a team of my colleagues, uh, starting from Sarah, uh, Lionel, and then we have Alan, Rob, and Jane. Uh, we uh, are here to talk a little bit about big data, a little bit about you know, how Nutanix uses big data, and a little bit about uh, the lessons that uh, we can learn from big data uh, when it comes to VDI. And uh, there was a short debate as to what we should really call this in terms of the topic, the headline. And uh, we kept thinking what's, what it's going to be that uh, will attract people who are here for the Bright Forum event. And uh, finally, it wasn't very clear. We couldn't conclude as to what the right topic should look like. But uh, be that as it may, I think at the last moment, I actually called it uh, something that looks a little bit more relevant for SBC or VDI or anything that relates to the Bright Forum event itself. So hopefully, you'll get something out of this. Uh, spend some good time just thinking about the overall analogies and the correlations and the lessons that uh, we learned from there. So uh, without further ado, if you look at the momentum, uh, the big data momentum of the last couple of years, it's really like the Arab Spring of enterprise computing. That's, that's the thing that uh, really excites everybody about uh, big data. Uh, it's massive. And we'll, we'll talk about what it really means to say it's massive. It's about people. It's a lot about the 6 billion plus people on, on the face of this earth. And also people to people, the way they talk to each other and the way they text each other, they use mobile devices, things like that. It's also been very swift. Uh, and we'll see what that, uh, what that really means in the context of uh, technology disruption and how quickly things have actually caught up. And lastly, the place where it makes a lot of sense for VDI, it's, it's about breaking away. It's about breaking away from uh, the old guard, from the old standards, and, and so on. So it's quite an interesting thing that uh, will relate breaking away to VDI as well. Um, so as I said, it, 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 this, this momentum is massive. It's massive because of the sources, you know, the multitude of sources that you can actually gather a lot of data from, all the way from mobile devices to surveillance cameras to RFID sensors to you know browser cookies to pretty much everything that you can log server logs firewall logs you know network switch logs and so on and anything that will be logged will be analyzed if not today tomorrow and that's what makes it extremely challenging you know all the way from clickstream to genomics to and this has uh, wide repercussions across uh, all the verticals that we actually live in um, and uh, what makes it even more challenging is the fact that it's about 6 billion plus people on the face of this earth. It's about the sentiments, about the likes, the dislikes, the plus ones, their tweets. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, parties like the government and the large corporations interested in knowing more about everybody. It's about corporations trying to make money on, you know, sending you the more relevant coupons. It's about uh, companies trying to advertise more relevant stuff with, to you when you're browsing something. It's about governments trying to know about everything that you're talking on an encrypted uh, BlackBerry channel. It's about uh, you know finding uh, the bad elements in society. And that's what makes it extremely challenging. So the combination of the sources talked about and the people makes it an extremely complex problem. And this is what's exciting a lot of people in this world at level. Well, there's a lot to learn. There's so many insights that are buried somewhere that we need to get to the bottom of. And lastly, it's the real-time nature of it, the fact that people want to know about these things in real time that makes it even more complicated. And that's why we have seen all these scientists and students and open source uh, you know, zealots actually unleash themselves on this, on this uh, wave because sky is not the limit. I mean, there's so much that you can actually learn about people and about what they do and how they do things and how much time they spend on a particular website and things like that. It's just an unfathomable uh, area. And uh, the thing that uh, is very peculiar, unique about this movement is the fact that it's been very swift. Uh, we've been looking at this for the last couple of years, maybe two plus years, and it's got to this point with such a groundswell uh, you know, movement uh, around this. Uh, and it's all about uh, the last two and a half, three years, really. It's quite unprecedented that, you know, there's a bunch of uh, concepts that came out of Google, 
that was open sourced by Yahoo, that's taken over by Facebook, and then there's a bunch of companies in the Valley starting to use it. And now every corporation, every small company, mid-sized company, uh, you know, governments or across the world, they want to be able to use this. There was a time when, you know, big data or analytics was really in the hands of a few government scientists and they thought they had the best, but they had nothing compared to what people can really look at today with, with uh, the tools and the software. It's really democratized this idea of analytics and, and looking at insights. And uh, it's also about the agility. Uh, I think a lot of developers who are developing this open source stuff are saying, we want to do things more agile. We want to really complete the cycle of getting feedback about what we have done and then you know, feed it back again and make better processes and make better decisions. Uh, and uh, we shouldn't have to be encumbered by multiple layers of the IT stack and so on. Yeah. Because they really value time to value. I mean, this is time to value speed to market is extremely important for them. Which basically uh, had them make a call on how they could be an autonomous organization. They broke away from everything that IT had actually delivered all this while for them. Enterprise computing to them was slowing them down. They wanted autonomy, they wanted independence. And they went ahead and flattened the infrastructure. Uh, they went ahead and, and made a new infrastructure for big data, which I think is one of the biggest lessons as you'll see for VDI as well. But what do I really mean about flattening of infrastructure? They said, we will do away with SANS. There's no need for shared storage for us. And uh, this is quite well documented. If you go to Wikipedia and search for big data, You'll find this in like bold terms. They're hostile to shared storage. They believe that it is against the tenets of what big data stands for. Uh, they believe that uh, SAM and NAS is, they're slow and complex and just expensive. And uh, these analytic systems, uh, they believe in the virtues of uh, system performance, commodity infrastructure, and low cost, all the things that most good um, you know, momentums are all about. It's about going and figuring out uh, how to get better performance, understanding how to use commodity in, uh, infrastructure if possible, and doing all of this at low cost. And I, I prefer to call this uh, the mutiny because this is the one big one, uh, one big thing that really flattened the infrastructure. The three-tier stack of computers, the, the servers, the networking gear in the middle, and the storage was collapsed into one tier by these guys. They said, we'll just go and buy HP servers. We don't really care to go and look at uh, NetApps and EMCs and so on and so forth. That, coupled with this other big phenomenon, uh, this is uh, kind of the other sub-movement within the overall big data movement. The ability to move away from SQL and from databases and from DBAs. They said, uh, there's no room for data warehousing in this whole thing. The old way of doing, last 20, 25 years of doing data warehousing, using Teradata or Oracle, or whatever. It's too expensive, it's slow, and it's, it's, an, it's kind of a shared disk architecture that doesn't really scale to the kind of data that we want to look at. And uh, SQL gave way to things that were restful uh, using HTTP. And this was just as big a, uh, big a movement uh, within big data, uh, the fact that they wanted to banish uh, databases and SQL and DBAs. And one of the offshoots of all of this, when they flattened this infrastructure, was they said, okay, if you need to take control of our infrastructure, we need to have a certain set of people, a certain set of skill sets that is definitely not IT. So what do we call it? They started to call it DevOps. And DevOps really democratized infrastructure because it gave them the autonomy and the independence of, uh, and access to really go and do things with their whole infrastructure, their projects, their ability to grow and shrink at will, the ability to go and procure things that they wanted to do. And uh, for them, they were paramount. They said, you know, we have our own projects and we want to do things in our own way with our own uh, speed and uh, be able to make those decisions uh, as quickly as we can. And DevOps is king today. If you actually look at uh, what's happening in the United States, uh, there's a whole movement around DevOps. There's uh, entire set of tools and people and experience and resumes and you know different sets of interviews. Everything is around uh, this new stream of people who are calling themselves different from IT. It's DevOps, right? So uh, eventually, this breaking away is all about 
simplifying the IT infrastructure. You know, we got rid of the SANS, we got rid of SQL and transactional databases. There's no such thing as transactions when you really, because transactions with databases is a very strict concept. It was for financial transactions. It was for CRM systems and ERP systems. And they said, the kind of data that we're looking at, it doesn't need to be transactional. It doesn't need to be as strict with respect to uh, you know, the guarantees that our databases actually provide. So they broke away from transactional databases. SQL hence went away as well. The monolithic systems went away. Uh, they didn't have to go and buy these very big, uh, you know, half a million dollar size boxes right away. They could just grow it at $15,000 increments and be able to really be agile in terms of adding and uh, shrinking their uh, cluster sizes and so on. And uh, finally, the network topologies, they flattened as well because all of a sudden you don't need to worry about well, here are the servers that are in this rack, and they connect to a top of the rack switch that connects to some sort of an access switch, to some core switch, to another access switch before it ends up in a big monolithic SAN. Now, all of a sudden, you, everything that you have is just one hop away. So you start from your server, you get to your storage, and if you need to get to a, a clustered storage, you just one hop over the top of the rack uh, network switch itself. So all of a sudden, the network became extremely flat. And you didn't have to do the complex, uh, you know, switching and, and uh, you know, getting like five network administrators uh, in a room to really figure out how you want to go from, you know, 10 terabytes to 50. It was basically a matter of adding more ports to your top of the rack switch and buying some more servers. So this has actually been uh, one of the biggest contributions of big data in, in the sense that they went ahead and they flattened the infrastructure, they simplified a lot of these things, and they took control. They said, you know, it is about us. It's not about IT. It's not about them providing us something. It's about us going and taking control of infrastructure. So what are some of the key concepts uh, in this whole big data phenomenon? So I'm going a, a layer below, you know, this uh, big picture thing around autonomy and independence and access uh, and flattening of infrastructure to something a little bit more detailed. So. Some of you might zone out, and that's fine, I think. I just wanted to get to some of the crux of uh, what big data was all about, because we at Nutanix use some of those concepts. And, and I think appreciating, appreciating exactly what these things are would uh, make you realize how much we've actually worked to make this work for virtualization, VDI, server-based computing, and, and things like that. But before I go on, I'm wondering if there are any questions, uh, just at a very high level, that we could address before we move to the next uh, set of uh, slides. Anyone? So what's the first big concept in, uh, in big data? It's this whole idea of massively parallel architecture. Uh, and there's a, an offshoot of massive parallelism. It's called embarrassingly parallel computing. Embarrassingly parallel is the ability to basically just throw it on the server. You throw a server and things get done. Uh, you won't really have to worry too much about what if I really want to add it to uh, add a few more sessions or a few more virtual desktops or a, a few more terabytes. How to really make this scale? You add a server and everything proportionately grows, all the way from compute power to uh, DRAM to network uh, uh, bandwidth to megabytes per second, IOPS, and so on. And embarrassingly parallel is the idea of being able to divide and conquer big problems. So if you have lots of data, you put them on lots of machines, and things get done. If you have twice the same amount of data, you just add 2x the same number of machines, and it will work at the same speed. That is the idea of embarrassingly parallel computing. So you take big problems, and you divide and conquer them by just splitting them among a bunch of machines. Uh, and if you needed to do more, you just add more machines is the big idea behind embarrassingly parallel computing. Now, all this works because of one reason. Uh, things are embarrassingly parallel because compute is local to storage. Uh, you are able to access data locally. And it's a very subtle concept, but it's very important to acknowledge the fact, just uh, uh, the fact that if the data were not local, then the network becomes the new bottleneck. So the data has to be local for things to be embarrassingly parallel. And that is what the big data phenomenon basically wanted. They wanted the data to be as local as possible so that they could access, fetch it over a PCI bus, as opposed to going behind an HBA and then a bunch of switches and then a storage controller and then the disk themselves. 
So it's very, very important to keep the data and, and compute as local to itself as possible. And then you can really call it an embarrassingly uh, parallel uh, problem or solution. And what we have done to use this concept of embarrassing parallel is build an embarrassingly parallel file system. We've built uh, something that goes all the way from four nodes to 4,000 nodes. There's no single point of bottleneck. There's no single point of failure. And it's predictable scalability. So you get one block, as we call it, uh, you know, one of these uh, uh, things here is called a block. Now that block is not really a single machine. It's four machines behind a bezel. And it's a small cluster that you start out with. But you can basically grow that uh, one four node cluster by adding a fifth node and a sixth node and a seventh, eighth, 10th, 50th, 100th, all, all the way uh, as big as possible. And why does it really scale to such large environments? It's because it's an embarrassingly par parallel system. Uh, there is uh, no single point of bottleneck. There's no single point of failure. And we really had to uh, illustrate this. We went ahead and built the largest, fastest file system ever built for a VMware environment. Um, this is also the industry's first unified. I call it unified because it gives you access to both NFS and iSCSI uh, as a backend. So if you think about uh, this system, it's not really a storage appliance. Nutanix is basically a data center in it to you. You get everything that you need to run your entire application stack. There's no need to really go behind this to a storage appliance at all. And this uh, to you block, oh, sorry, I'm this to you block here is basically having everything that you need to run your application, all the way from compute to uh, storage and a virtual network in the middle. All you need to connect these nodes together is a 10 gigabit top of the rack switch. What we present to the hypervisor looks very much like a NetApp or an EMC. So it's an NFS target that's sitting right there in the same box. It just happens to be a very large distributed system that looks like one single system. So VMware or any other hypervisor doesn't blink. It continues to think it's talking to one big system, but it's not. And we then take the initiative to keep all the data as local as possible. So if a virtual machine needs to access something, it's right there. Or it goes to the hypervisor or a virtual network uh, to our controller, which is a virtual controller. And then it goes and fetches it from a local Fusion IO card or from a local hard disk driver and Intel SSD itself. And uh, it's unified because it basically gives you both NFS and iSCSI ways of actually accessing this target. You, you don't really need to have proprietary ways of using hypervisor APIs to really access this information. I also call it converged because it basically is compute plus storage in one. Uh, you don't have to buy a separate blade chassis with a bunch of blades to uh, really run your application. This is the place where you run everything, all the way from you know, your Zen app environment to your virtual desktops to your AppSense to your Active Directory, all that stuff can be hosted inside this uh, system here. The other big concept, apart from, you know, the idea of massive parallelism and the idea of uh, embarrassingly parallel computing is what is called NoSQL by the big data guys. As I said, it's the ability to get rid of uh, transactional databases because those guarantees are not required for a lot of the work that these uh, applications really do. But the high level idea about NoSQL is to spread your data across a cluster of machines and then you have very low latency to access it. And this happens without having to use SQL. And there's a bunch of companies in this uh, space. There's MongoDB, there's Couchbase, there's Cassandra, which basically tout this. And Google is building its own, it's called Bigtable, and Facebook has its some, something of its own called Edgebase. So they're all building some things which basically bypasses the whole SQL stack. And uh, you can add more machines, and you can, uh, as you add more machines, you get more performance and capacity to host these in the memory and in Fusion IO cards and so on and so forth. And now when a, uh, somebody needs to query them, they, it knows exactly where to route the request to machine number 1,000 or 5,042, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And if you add more users, you just throw more servers and you're able to scale this thing. So that's the whole idea behind NoSQL, embarrassingly parallel key value stores. Uh, I call it key value because most of the access is done by a key. So you get a key and then you want the value for that key. So you query it based on the key itself. Uh, and it's 
not a very complex uh, you know, schema design with lots of columns and the traditional database way of doing things. Uh, they've kept it simple because the, this problem of uh, uh, scaling to a very large number of key value pairs doesn't really need a uh, complex schema uh, from the SQL point of view itself. Now, how does Nutanix use NoSQL? Uh, if you think about the problem that you're solving, you're building a very large file system. And this file system basically sits on all the machines. Uh, so if you have 50 machines, the file system basically occupies all the storage, which is local to these 50 machines. Uh, and it tries to present a single system view so that it all looks like shared storage, even though it's not really shared storage. So there's a bunch of metadata. Right? And the metadata is the place to go and query for where is the user's data located. So if you get an NFS query for a certain file to go and be able to access an offset of a file, we use the metadata to go and figure out which machine, which disk on that machine, and which location within that disk. So all this is actually captured in this infrastructure, which we call the metadata. And uh, this metadata is massively parallel. It's present in every cluster node. So as you add more machines, you also get not just more user capacity, but you also get more metadata capacity. And this is the one big reason why I call it uh, an embarrassingly parallel system, because there's no single point of bottleneck. You add more machines, you don't just get more capacity, you also get more performance, because the index, the metadata itself, scales. So yeah, so it rebalances when nodes are added and removed. So you add uh, one more machine, and the metadata also ripples over and rebalances among all these machines. Just like the user data should, the metadata should as well. It's lockless. So this one of the big uh, impediments to really scaling metadata is taking a lot of locks. It's going back to the idea of transactions in databases where you, know, you need to go and lock it first, make the update, and unlock it to get better concurrency when multiple uh, you know, clients are trying to update to read the same kind of uh, rows. Uh, and I think we've done something really nifty here. We use some extremely uh, complex techniques to make this lockless. And it's very important. Lockless is about optimistic updates, the fact that you can go and update it assuming that no one else is going to update it. And it's a very beautiful concept in virtualization because more often than not, in virtualization, the virtual disk is only being accessed by one virtual machine. So we have to leverage some of those, uh, you know, the freedom that we get because of uh, the virtualization workload to be able to not go in, you know, uh, basically fall back on locking when you can do without it. So it's a very important concept that makes it really scale well. So what's our NoSQL uh, database? We've actually forked off the open source Cassandra project uh, because uh, we really had to get uh, these concepts in place, lockless and distributed consensus. And the open source version doesn't have any on this. So we had to go and build up one on our own to really make the storage friendly and get the consistency and other guarantees that otherwise uh, the open source NoSQL movement doesn't really care much for. But it's been a big change to the Cassandra project itself. Now this is a pretty dense slide and maybe I'll spend a little bit more time on this, but um, depends on how much you would like to appreciate the, this is the third big concept. We talked about embarrassingly parallel systems. We talked about NoSQL. But finally, the big one, the, the big uh, heavy lifting part of big data is called MapReduce. Uh, and uh, at a very high level, it's the ability to divide, conquer, sort, shuffle, and collect uh, as kind of the five uh, stage pipeline to doing anything on a large number of machines when you have lots of data. Um, and uh, I'd like to start with a small example. You know, this is a classic big data problem for the web guys. You know, they have a lot of click streams. They look at Apache logs, and uh, they capture a lot of these Apache web server logs. And every day, they actually pump this, these logs into their Hadoop system, you know, this big data system, which is the open source uh, version of uh, big data. And they need to go and analyze these things. They need to figure out who's doing what based on their IP addresses and the zip codes or pin codes or based on the geographies and based on anything else they can find about these people, demographics. They can try to connect the IP address information with some other third party partner to figure out your age and your income group and your house value and everything else. So they want to do all this uh, analysis based on your browsing patterns. 
So this uh, is a big data, classic big data problem. It's a click stream data, and a website could have lots and lots of data to really go and crunch. So what do they do? They actually start out with uh, the input, which is the uh, these Apache log files, and they're actually sorted in time because they basically keep getting these logs for every hour or every two hours or whatever. And they go ahead and shred all this data on a, among a bunch of machines. So now these machines have data that are really sort, uh, not sorted, but kind of shredded or sharded by time. Uh, so all of today's data could be sitting on this machine, and yesterday's data could be on some, some other machine, and so on and so forth. Now they have to go and run this analysis, summing up all the clicks coming from a user, right? Now you realize that all the clicks from a certain IP address are not in one machine, they're all over the place because we went ahead and actually sharded the data based on time because we kept pumping all this data in a bunch of machines uh, based on how they were being logged in Apache web server itself. So this problem cannot be solved locally because not all the data is, is there. Uh, if I have 10,000 IP addresses, they're all over the place. The same IP clicks from today are in this machine, from yesterday in some other machine, and so on and so forth. So what does, uh, what does uh, this MapReduce job let you do? It basically says, run your local stuff. Just find out what you can. Group them by IP addresses on your own individual machines. And that's called the map phase. So you have local data, do the best that you can. And, uh, after you do that, you'll form these intermediate results. You know? So there'll be the green ones which from a certain IP address, the red ones from some other IP address, the yellow ones from some other. We have intermediate results, but they're not good enough for the final uh, result itself. So we'll go ahead and actually sort and shuffle this. So now is the time when we are temporarily putting all the IP addresses, but not all the data, only the summary. Remember, this, this, this is actually a summary. So there's a lot of information that was summarized into count uh, IP address and the number 54, which is the count of clicks coming from that one machine. So there's very little information that needs to be shuffled. And that is the power of MapReduce, that you've been able to do as much as possible when the data was local. You summarized it all, made it into pithy sub-summaries, and now you're able to shuffle all this stuff. And it gets to another phase, which is called the reduce. It's a reduction phase. Reduction is about saying, well, I have all the intermediate results. And I think I can make a big picture summary of uh, IP addresses. Because by this time, after I've shuffled the red ones, uh, now this, this machine here has access to all the clicks, or at least the sum of the clicks, from a certain IP address. And they go ahead and sum it all up. I have the final answer. I have a bunch of all the IP addresses and a sum of all the clicks. So this is how you actually solve the first problem, right? Is this clear enough to people? I mean, was I lucid enough by this time? So you did the map, which is about taking a lot of information, a lot of junk. I mean, the junk was about URLs, and it had a lot of other columns in the click stream that I didn't really care for, because this query was about just summing up the clicks. So I could actually go ahead and uh, discard all that, get the, just the sum of the clicks, shuffle them in a very fast way, get to the next phase, and then I have final results. And it gets more interesting. Suppose I needed to know the top 10 IP addresses with most clicks. Now this is where MapReduce can become, uh, as I say, pipelined. Where the results coming out of the reduce phase, which are again key values, because you know, we basically came up with the uh, with a new key called the IP address, and the value is sum of all the sum of the clicks, right? There's a new key value. I can use that to feed into a next phase of MapReduce, right? Because at this time, I need to know something more. The top 10 IP addresses with most clicks. So I need every machine to now say, give me your top 10, right? And that's the map phase. And then I can shuffle them all and perhaps get to one reducer. It says, okay, I got all the top 10s from all the machines. I can now do a final top 10. So as you can see, you can actually pipeline these map reduce phases where the results of a reduction can become an input for the next map phase, and then more, some more reduction and so on. So they say that 95% of the world's problems can actually be mapped to map reduce, And that's, what, that's why it's so popular. Pretty much all the 
you know, analytics that you've seen in the past where it's uh, the SaaS scientists sitting there on their computer screens and doing, you know, regression analysis and clustering, a lot of the statistical stuff can all be mapped to MapReduce. Maybe not in one phase, maybe in two phases. I mean, Google does its indexing and the, and the crawling and the sorting of all that information in 17 phases of MapReduce. But finally, they are able to do this in a very embarrassingly parallel way. They throw half a million machines and they get, they were able to crawl the data on an everyday basis. So that, this is the real crux of uh, big data. And the reason why it's relevant to Nutanix is because our metadata is basically a sharded system and we need to do a lot of things with uh, our metadata. You know, we, by the way, one thing I want to mention is that we do not use Hadoop. We've actually built our own MapReduce framework uh, to really take care of the kind of things that we need to do within our cluster. So what do we really uh, do in our cluster? If you think about the problem, the problem statement is, Nutanix's metadata is sharded, it's partitioned, it's, it's on a bunch of machines. And they're partitioned by a certain key, and that key is not always useful when you need to do a few other things. Like for example, we run, we constantly run heuristics on access patterns. And what does it mean? So if we realize that this particular piece of data from an NFS file or an iSCSI LUN is being accessed too often from a hard disk tier, we actually bump it up to the flash tier. Right? Similarly, if you think that something has not been accessed for too long, we actually go and bump it down to the SATA tier, whether it's an Intel tier or, or it's a Seagate hard disk drive tier. Uh, we, if you realize that the virtual machine is moved, you know, suppose you, somebody did a V motion of the virtual machine, and now the VM is accessing data from another cluster node, we can bring all that hot data locally. So that's the way we actually learn about access patterns all the time, constantly trying to figure out uh, heuristics around metadata and things like that. We use the same techniques uh, of heavy de data lifting to rebalance our storage. So if you add more machines, the data has to actually now rebalance itself. And we do the same map reduction phase to figure out what needs to be moved and, and things like that. Uh, we waterfall data, as I said, between uh, flash tiers and spindle tiers. We heal the cluster. So if you need to recover a disk, we go and look at the metadata to figure out, OK, so what extent, so what pieces of the data actually lay on those disks, on that failed disk? We find it all out, and then we let every other disk help in its recovery. So unlike uh, the traditional RAID systems where one disk has one mirror, so when you have to recover, you need to go back to that other mirror to resilver the other disk, we actually have data for one disk spread in every other disk. So you can now realize how much this is a massively parallel problem. You can actually go back to every other disk and reco recover uh, that one failed one. Same thing with failed nodes. If you have a failed node because it's CPU died or motherboard, motherboard fried, every other node can actually be involved in recovering that one uh, machine itself. We garbage collect a lot of things and uh, we do a bunch of things with snapshots and BAI and a bunch of things that arrays are good at doing where link clones and other such technologies actually fall uh, behind quite a bit. In fact, uh, um, we've come to realize that uh, VMware is going back to the basics. It's saying, you know, all right, guys, you know snapshots much better. I think we screwed up with link clones. Let's just start doing things more using array technologies as opposed to us having to reinvent the wheel with storage. So um, I think VAI is a start. And the next one, which is relevant to VDI, is VCAI, basically talking about how uh, View Composer can leverage snapshot technology coming out of the array itself uh, and be able to use that to compose and, and reimage and things like that. So you'll see a lot more uh, initiative and effort in that direction going forward. So by the way, just to summarize, I think this is actually uh, a big part of uh, uh, what we do at Nutanix. We use NoSQL, we use embarrassingly parallel systems, and we actually go ahead and use MapReduce to really do a lot of heavy lifting of uh, uh, maintaining the cluster, moving the data around, and then so on and so forth. So what's the takeaway for VDI in all of this? I mean, this is basically what the you know, um, topic of discussion was. And what I want to mention is just you know, taking a look back at the last three years of VDI. I think my observations uh, about the last three years has been that VDI was one piece of infrastructure that couldn't figure out a way to break away. I think it was too much in the hands of the existing traditional IT infrastructure stack and, and People, there was legacy stuff. There's a lot of ugly retrofitting going on. Square peg in a round hole. 
Well, this virtualization workload is very different than server virtualization. You're talking about thousands of virtual machines that you wanted to provision hundreds in a single day and maybe delete hundreds in a single day. It's a very different virtualization workload. That was not the same as server virtualization. And that's why I think VDI was stalled for the longest time because the infrastructure was not ready and it was even if it was ready, it was too expensive that people couldn't really justify the costs of using such a, an infrastructure. There's too much consensus building as well. You know, the people who really own the apps, the Zen app folks, the VDI folks, the desktop folks, they didn't have all the power to make calls and they had to get a lot of people in the room and then get a lot of consensus around what servers, what storage, what networks and things like that. Um, how, where to start, how to scale, when can we grow and shrink, when do we start a pilot, all those things uh, were missing. Uh, there was very little <coughs> prototyping going on and the prototyping was again in the hands of like a bunch of people, there were like four different teams that had to come together to really do this. The pilot was very different than production. At the end of the day, uh, if I did something with a pilot with a cheaper SAN and, and a bunch of uh, uh, blades uh, with, with uh, compute in them, all of a sudden I realized that when I went from 200 virtual desktops in a pilot to 2,000, things look extremely different. And not just performance-wise, but also cost-wise. I mean, the economics just blows up. You're like, wow, I didn't even realize that to be able to get to 2,000, I have to buy this expensive, a NAS box or a sandbox to really get things going. So there's very little predictability going on between pilot and production. And uh, as I said, you know, I think, uh, our observation has been that application owners had, had very little power to really do things and move, move uh, things at their own pace, which is very different from big data. I think that's where big data really ran away and broke away from tradition and said, we're gonna take things in our own hands, we'll form DevOps and we'll flatten this whole thing and we'll think about things differently, more top down than bottom up. Trying to have the IT stack come and solve this problem, think about it from our point of view. Maybe it's a different problem that needs to have a different solution. But this is a very important piece here, which uh, is an observation that really excites us a lot. We believe that VDI is an embarrassingly parallel problem, if only the storage was local. Because if you need to throw 1,000 more desktops, it's, it should ideally be like you threw 1,000 more physical desktops, right? You get more compute, you get more RAM, you get more local disks, and boom, you're ready to go. Now, just because you consolidated them doesn't mean that it's no more embarrassingly parallel. It should be like that, right? And that is what Nutanix is actually trying to solve here. We're saying that assuming that storage is local, you should not have to worry a lot about the infrastructure. And if you were able to throw a few servers at the problem, you'd be able to scale your virtual desktop infrastructure just as well. Inherently, VDI is an embarrassingly parallel problem. So this is our mission. I think uh, Nutanix is not a VDI only company. And I think I mentioned that in this uh, last bullet. It's kind of a subtle point that you can run server virtualization inside of us as well. You know, we're not just built for VDI. We are really a sandless data center, uh, which uh, basically converges compute and storage, is massively parallel, uses a lot of the goodness of the big data, uh, and uh, scales uh, all the way from four nodes to 4,000 nodes. So uh, what is handless VDI? You know, it's the ability to bring the disk back to the PC, which is the way things were, right? And not literally, we're not really talking about bringing an individual hard disk and dedicated to virtual desktop, but you virtualize that problem. And still, a virtual desktop is only accessing things locally and then never uh, over a network at all, never over like two storage controllers that are basically now the big bottleneck and everything, right? So what else do you get when you actually uh, bring a controller into every ASX host? Your caching is local. So now every time you throw in a new ASX host or some hypervisor a host, you have a controller and now boot storms go away because you can have the cache right there over the PCI bus. You don't really have to fetch this over a bunch of uh, uh, network uh, components before you end up on the disk itself. Flash is local. And this flash is more than just a cache flash. This flash keeps all your data persistent and protected and, and disaster recover, uh, recoverable and, uh, and things like that. Uh, as I said, you know, we have unified stack, so it's not just NFS, it's NFS and, and iSCSI, but in NFS is a very simple protocol. It helps you manage things. Even if uh, you've not been doing 
too much virtualization or storage or whatever, NFS keeps it very simple. And we've done a lot of hard work on the UI side of things to bring the whole Apple class experience for the infrastructure where people who have never dealt with virtualization, never dealt with storage, can actually manage this cluster relatively simply. Dedupe is massive. You know, you get a lot of deduplication because of the array-based technologies we have developed around uh, snapshots, flex clones, VAI plugins, and now VCAI going forward. You don't need a separate NetApp for your user data. It's right there. It's persistent. Uh, it's uh, enterprise grade. So you don't have to worry about, now, well, for everything else, I have the C drive, I have this thing. And for the D drive, I need to go somewhere else. No, there's no need to. You basically just put everything in this one unified stack, and you're good to go. Pilot is production, is not different from production. You start with the 2U, you, you say, well, what am I get, getting out of this? Well, 300 virtual desktops. So if I need to get to 3,000, what do I need? Well, it's predictable. You just get 10 blocks and it's good to go because it's an embarrassingly parallel problem. Nutanix has solved the ability to keep data local and all of a sudden you can say, well, it's going to cost me this much at 3,000, it's going to cost me this much for 6,000 and so on. Because even the economics are now predictable, right? It's a very important point. As I said, you know, we're not just a VDI company. We don't just we haven't just built this for uh, VDI. In fact, we have lots of customers who use this for server virtualization and even big data. In fact, running Hadoop inside of Nutanix is a big use case that's happening in private clouds today. So Zenapp can actually be run in the same shared infrastructure. You don't really need to. Think about where else is this hardware going to come from, storage going to come from, IOPS and megabytes going to come from. But last but not the least, I think it's the whole idea that the app owner is paramount. You have the freedom to actually go and pick and choose the infrastructure. You can own this if it's simple. If, if there is a vendor out there that can keep it simple, then you don't have to worry about, well, I have never done virtualization. I have never done storage. How can I manage my own infrastructure? Well, Nutanix can actually keep it simple for you. And that's the, I think the biggest lesson for me at least, you know, is the fact that uh, big data was about freedom, was about autonomy, was about independence and access to things that you really wanted to do at your own pace. And if you can get a stack that does this for you, it's refreshing. And I think your customers are telling you that too. I mean, in fact, when I mean, this whole BYOD thing is exactly that. People want to bring their own devices. They're like, well, I need an iPad, I need an iPhone, I need all those things. It's about freedom. It's about freedom of choice. It's about bringing your own device to work, and then, well, others will figure out how to keep it secure, and um, what does it mean to really make it part of the network, and things like that. I think uh, with that, I come to my last slide. It's about breaking away. I think it's time for you the app owner to figure out whether you want to bring your own infrastructure into this equation. And I call it BYY. It's really not trademark, but you know, it's just we leave that for Brian Madden to really go and uh, trademark going forward. But it's the ability to actually bring your own stuff into this um, and say, if there's a foundation that can support me, then this rising hand is going to be powerful. And that is the biggest lesson from big data, the autonomy. That's all I have. Uh, if there are any questions I can answer right now, I do that. Lionel Marks, my colleague here, has a few other slides that actually gets to Nutanix as a company and just makes it look a little real, has some videos, some customer references, things like that. And that's involved with everything. <laughs> any questions before we move on? Uh, Lionel, do you want to actually bring your laptop here in case? Sure. Anybody have any questions? Is it just VMware support? Today, but uh, if you realize, I mentioned the fact that we expose an NFS and iSCSI target, so we don't use any VMware APIs to drive the traffic to our controllers. So we are hypervisor agnostic, and uh, we are listening to the market. We know exactly what's coming. The mid-market, the high-velocity deals will happen over Hyper-V in the next 18 months. So we are very quick to adapt to the market conditions. So we'll have something in real time. Does that answer your question? Anyone else? Any questions? Yeah. Sure. Um, you're saying about putting user data on it as well. You're doing that you're for things like uh, DR site replication. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we, give, we give you all the 
NetApp goodness in this thing, right? Because you bring all of that intelligence into the same tier of machines. You know, you can't, you can't uh, claim to solve convergence if you don't have all the goodness from network storage, like right here. No, no, it's just it's standard. standard yeah, it's just ESX host that you will see actually. The same. Oh, absolutely, all of that stuff actually. So, I mean, the good thing is that the same vCenter that was handling your non-Nutanix stack, the legacy stack of blades and storage and network in the middle, the same vCenter can actually handle this Nutanix stack as well. You can have heterogeneous clusters. You can manage it as if it's. It just so happens that Nutanix's ESX hosts don't need to talk to the storage underneath. It's all self-contained. Any questions you have? Yeah, is there a way for, for segmentation? So if I have a mixed environment, so I have not just VDI, I have got thermal server, which each huge I.O. and I've got some um, data server, which can sit on a, a SATA drive. Absolutely. So how does, how does it fit? Or because it's yeah, so I think uh, when we designed the system two and a half years ago, we said it has to be cloud ready, which is multi-tenancy multi ready in some sense. You know, And what you're just bringing out is SLAs, differentiation between services. and So we've built these abstractions called storage pools and then containers. The storage pool basically says you can still physically segment uh, the cluster. You can say, well, this storage pool is going to have its own set of disks and flash and whatever else. And this storage pool is going to have its own set of disks and flash and so on. And within that, you can have containers which basically steal from each other and spill over into each other, and they're overcommitted in terms of storage and so on. So thin provisioning and all that goodness applies there. And now you can have SLAs. You can say, well, uh, there is a certain set of apps that I just want to be pinned on the flash uh, Fusion IO tier, a certain set of apps that just need to avoid this and go directly to the disk itself. Uh, so you can make all those uh, calls in a sh single shared infrastructure. You know, right? So it gives you the ability to carve out uh, isolation of hardware. And then within that, you can actually go and put containers which can have properties like, well, this container is encrypted, and this one is compressed, and so on and so forth. So you can do all that stuff as a property of the container. Now, containers are overcommitted. So they might end up stealing from each other in terms of storage capacity. But this still will be kind of the virtual boundaries for properties like things like compression, encryption, RAID properties you can have. You can say, well, this one is RAID 0. I don't care. It's non-persistent. Uh, this one is actually going to be persistent because I know that it needs some mirroring. And, and so you can do all sorts of things <laughs> from a virtual disk point of view. You know, if you think of a legacy storage box, if you buy a dual-headed NAS, every piece of traffic will get HA. Well, like, well, I don't really care for HA for my non-persistent stuff, right? So we give you the ability to actually make those decisions as late as possible, saying, well, these, they don't get any HA. And these, when they write to the Fusion IO, it better write to two Fusion IOs across the network. And these bypass Fusion IO at all. So you can make all these calls in a shared infrastructure with the ability for you to use this one piece of shared uh, you know, hardware and yet make these calls about uh, services and SLAs and guarantees when you're really creating the containers and the virtual machines and the virtual disks themselves. Any other questions? I don't know if it's covered in the next bit, but if you're talking, if all your storage devices are so disparate and data is resyncing and moving around, how big is the backplane? What type of backplane is it between the so nodes? And it's a 10 giggy backplane. Okay. And the good thing is that the 10 giggy backplane is also a converged network because you can use software-defined networking techniques, SDN, vSwitch policies, to traffic shape and to provide quality of service, which is the whole beauty of this thing, that you don't need to physically decouple things. I think we're coming to a world where people are scratching the surface of networking by saying, you know, all this should be software-defined. What we're doing is storage that's software-defined. Right? I just mentioned all these things about policies and HA and RAID and you know, all that stuff should be software-defined. It shouldn't be like, well, I bought this hardware, and now every piece of traffic gets the same you know, set of SLAs or something, right? OK, thank you. Can you guys hear? Oh, perfect. All right, well, uh, I wanted to welcome everybody to uh, Bry Forum and the Nutanix presentation. And I also wanted to um, have everybody welcome Nutanix to EMEA, because this is uh, the week that we'll be launching Nutanix uh, here in Europe. 
Uh, we'll be hosting, uh, just as an FYI, we'll be hosting a party this evening at 4.30 uh, p.m. at the Grand Union Hotel. So uh, everybody here is welcome, and uh, please invite your friends. So uh, a little bit about Nutanix. Um, we launched at VMworld 2011 in San Francisco, so less than a year ago. And what's so exciting about Nutanix for me is that um, I originally came from VMware, spent six years there, and Nutanix has exceeded all sort of growth records in the industry when you compare it to every other infrastructure appliance manufacturer that has uh, entered into this market. Um, if you look at us compared to Riverbed and uh, Data Domain or Palo Alto Networks, um, Nutanix is actually growing at record pace, uh, and that's pretty exciting stuff. Um, and when I joined VMware, uh, one of the things that was really exciting for me, the thing that really um, was, I found my calling essentially, um, is that it really combined two sort of things that I was passionate about. I was passionate about technology, I was always also passionate about uh, making a difference, helping the world become a better place. And I think that is no, no, no better represented than looking at pictures of people, right, um, benefiting from the virtues of virtualization. Um, and on the left is uh, Michael Graff, on the right is Eric Hall. Michael Graff was a you know, husband, father of three, super stressed out you know, with his infrastructure job, had to deal with several hundred servers. And this was a picture after the virtual, the deployed VMware. Um, and it was, I think, a momentous event because they went from being like really unhappy, you know, very stressed out, not super excited about their jobs, to sort of moving their, their company forward, moving the world of data center infrastructure forward by being early adopters. Now, this is um, Dolby Labs based out in San Francisco. So I'm sure you're all familiar with digital surround sound and noise reduction. But these guys are innovators, and they were the ones that really saw the, the value of virtualization very early on. And you know, this was the result. Um, you know, you, the, the paradox of Dolby Labs was they were innovating consumer-grade products, the things that got smaller and smaller over time, but yet their data center infrastructure got bigger and bigger with the sprawling rows of servers. And they were able to shrink that entire data center down to merely 8U. Um, so it was a very impressive feat for them, and this became, you know, well, one of the uh, customers that we would tout to many of the other um, prospects out in the, uh, the Bay Area. But, um, you know, what's interesting about this whole phenomenon is, I'm sorry, there's one more customer, Tom Weisinger. He had, it was interesting because Dolby Labs was a rather large organization, but yet uh, there were organizations that were even smaller than them that had even more servers. So you look at uh, a law firm in, based in San Francisco, and this is Tom Weisinger. He had three rows, three rows of x86 servers and storage and networking. And you can even see some of those old school compact servers that they still had, legacy equipment, uh, the, the, the beige version of hardware back in the day. Um, that just consumed a ton of space. I mean, an entire room facility was dedicated to their data center. And after VMware or virtualization, they were able to shrink that that entire uh, three-row data center down to one single rack. So kind of moving from rooms down to closets. It's a pretty amazing feat. But the ugly truth was this was really, at the end of the day, you know, the biggest space hog after that virtualization revolution took place. This shared storage is really what consumes not only a massive amount of space in the data center, but it also consumes a significant portion of uh, the virtualization budget. And it's a very unnatural fit uh, you know, for virtualization because VMware in itself is a very horizontally scalable, or, or virtualization is a horizontally scale, scale out technology. Um, you, know, you can start small and then grow as you go and add nodes to that infrastructure. But yet it relies on this monolithic legacy technology that is extremely unscalable. You may be able to add more shells, but eventually the controller will run out of capacity to host those shells. So you have to end up buying more and more controllers. And in fact, this is what it ends up looking like. It's very scary, right? It, it's almost like the Borg taking over the, the, the galaxy. It's just they keep multiplying and exploding inside of the, the data center because this has become a, the linchpin of uh, the, the data center now. And it's a 30-year-old technology. It seems like it's a misfit. Um, and as more and more workloads sort of filter their way onto the sand, the problem gets even worse. It's starting to magnify. Um, and so that's really, I think, the biggest challenge that faces this community of users, right? People that uh, IT professionals focused on desktops is that how do you, how do you manage um, those competing 
you know, needs of the business, the project owners that need virtualized desktops for those unique use cases, but at the, at the same time, you have to implement that on a, an environment that requires technology from, you know, from many decades ago. So uh, centralization is essentially a, an alien world, right, for desktops. It's a distributed system by nature. Um, and I think, you know, to bring it home, it's what is really a desktop? And I thought this picture was pretty representative of where desktops really began their lives, right? It began their lives as kind of going beyond the mahogany bureau of the uh, last century and, and uh, taking the printing press technology and bringing it to the masses, right? Giving them an information revolution that allowed them to be uh, creative um, and empowering them to, to innovate, you know, new ways of thinking and new ways of distributing information. So this was really the information revolution at the very beginning, right? Is giving people the power to, to publish. Um, and then sort of, there was sort of a, a what we call a, a turn of events where, you know, digitiz digitization came around um, and it took somewhat of a detour. It went back to centralized infrastructure. So I'm sure some of you remember these sorts of things, these green screens or terminals. They were acquired very expensive infrastructure, centralized infrastructure in the data center, and then provided the end user the ability to access that infrastructure from, a great, um, from, from their local desktops. But it required a tremendous amount of capital investment to get these sorts of technologies at the fingertips of the end user. So it wasn't really accessible to the masses, right? The, the, the notion of being able to take advantage of uh, word processing or applications, spreadsheets, uh, data manipulation um, really was only um, in, in the domain of uh, large enterprises that had the, the resources to deliver these sorts of technologies. Um, so, but the rebellion of the masses, I think, is universal. The, 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 the need and the yearn, yearning for technology to do th similar things um, at the home, uh, you know, for, for, in a, for creativity and, and uh, expression. Um, is always, I think, the, the driving force and the fuel for our, the world of technology that we live in. And we have a little company, a little known company, to thank for helping and empowering the end user, that company being Apple. Um, and not surprisingly, they continue to this day to you know, kind of make the, the lives of a desktop IT administrator rather difficult, right? It's the consumerization of IT that is creating an even more complex problem for uh, the virtual desktops. It's no longer, well, let's just virtualize and consolidate desktops into the data center. It's now, how do we actually project these, data, these desktops out to uh, the edge with mobile devices such as iPhones and tablet PCs? Um, and so I think one of the, another interesting point I'd like to make is it's science fiction, right, that kind of dreams up these crazy ideas uh, it's it's the dreamers that spend you know and it's the dreamers that spend every waking hour trying to bring fiction to reality. And the speed of innovation is really accelerating. I mean, what took once 40 years to get from this vision of a tablet device from 2001, the Space Odyssey, to reality, has gone has shrunk down to almost a decade. So Minority Report's vision of a hand waving user interface is now reality, and that's being driven by you know. The, the fact that technology is moving faster and faster every day, and you have to have technology to help you solve those problems at an even faster pace, so you can satisfy the needs of your business, be more competitive, and be more relevant in a new economy. So the last example I want to point out is big data, to kind of tie in this theme of how we actually build our product, is big data has been dreamed up by many uh, science fiction writers and movie makers. If you don't remember the Whopper, it came from the War Games starring Matthew Broderick, and the purpose of this computer was to help save lives, to predict what the outcome of war would be like, you know, so that they could be, do better war planning. Um, and that was all based on this notion of being able to crunch large volumes of data, um, or potentially get in the way of human life, in this case, HAL 9000. But, but the notion of having information at your fingertips at the speed of thought is now really in the realm of reality, right? We do have the HAL 9000s, we do have the Whoppers, we do have the ability to um, correlate vast amounts of data and infinitely, you know, in infinite volumes and search them at a very rapid pace. And so the question is, how does Google do it, right? Um, and the answer is, 
And you look at all their other sort of cohorts in this space, they all build data centers in very similar ways. Um, and so to our brand and our logo and our, and our sort of call to action, the hook, is that all of these companies, all of these data centers, they don't use SANS. And the reason why is it wouldn't be economically feasible. And number two, it wouldn't be very fast. Uh, there was just no, no feasible way of connecting hundreds of thousands of nodes to one single SAN. It's a very difficult problem to solve. So what's driving this revolution? Um, well, Flash is number one, helping to solve those problems. High speed, uh, high speed uh, storage attached directly to the server and to Diraj's discussion later, uh, uh, earlier on, being able to provide local access to the application so they don't have to go across these sleepy networks that are congested with all sorts of other traffic. And when you look at this particular product, uh, Fusion IO, which is quite popular now in the industry, um, it's a very, uh, you know, it might look like an expensive hard drive on the surface of it because it does cost $6,000 for 300 gig, but it delivers the kind of performance you would expect out of a $1 million SAN. So it really truly is commoditizing enterprise storage performance. But the problem is, is that it's not virtualization friendly. How do you actually use this $6,000 card to deliver the kind of performance you get out of a million dollar EMC or NetApp? Well, what you need is specialized software. So this is really what we're doing at the end of the day is Nutanix is taking all of the, the benefits of the, the original physical model, right, where the applications and the storage and the compute all lived on one single piece of hardware, which was easy to manage and easy to size, but yet was uh, a big waste of resources as hardware started to advance and applications really weren't catching up. So there's this huge gap in terms of processor waste. The virtualized infrastructure, however, solved that problem by allowing one server to do the work of many, but again, was very dependent on this very old legacy design, this very old technology. So distributed systems really have kind of changed the game for these large cloud providers. They've given uh, these, these very few vendors the ability to get the speed and performance of a physical system, but also increase utilization to the point where they didn't have to virtualize at all. They got all the benefits of high speed and also uh, through the abstraction of the hardware via the API versus actually abstracting at the hardware level. But the challenge with the distributed system is that it requires very customized applications that most enterprises don't have access to uh, or don't have the, the resources and the pedigree of expertise to develop those applications. So a Google and an Amazon can hire you know, hundreds of MIT and Stanford graduates or Oxford graduates in this case, uh, but that's not really uh, something an enterprise can do, mainly because most of them have been hired by Google, Facebook, and Amazon. Uh, and it's really not their core expertise. It's not their core um, domain of, of innovation. They usually focus on other things. So Nutanix is about bringing these two worlds together, right? It's, or actually all three worlds together to get the best of all three worlds. Um, and that's really uh, gonna be the second part of this conversation. So what's the problem? The problem is, is that there's just too many workloads talking to that one single monolithic SAN, and it continues to get worse. It's not getting better. And if you guys haven't even started thinking about a virtual desktop a project or you're just about to begin, I think everybody is probably fretting this scenario, having to talk to that enterprise SAN administrator um, who is already overtaxed and overburdened with dealing with the enterprise server workloads. So Nutanix, as Diraj discussed earlier, is all about um, distributing you know, the, the resources across every available physical host. So putting flash and storage back where it belongs, back on the physical server, just like it was in the physical world, and just like it is in the distributed world, but provide the same abstraction layer that enterprises really uh, depend on to de deliver enterprise workloads based on Windows or Linux. And then making it general purpose, not just single purpose. If you look at a lot of other solutions out there, they're all very focused on VDI, 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 and it's all about VDI acceleration. We're building a general purpose platform for a SANless data center that allows you to virtualize any application and get the benefits that you're typically hearing from vendors in this space that speak to flash acceleration or serialization of IO. So what does it look like? Um, well, it's this cute little pizza box right here. When you compare it to the traditional designs of the past, uh, and these are actually representing 
an evolved version of the traditional design. These are pre-packaged solutions from the uh, uh, enterprise vendors such as VCE and NetApp, but they still rely on uh, your age-old SAN, right? They haven't really quite solved the problem. They've combined a number of different components together in a very easy or consumable format so a CIO can make a big purchase uh, you know, and, and not have to deal with an enterprise architecture engagement. So Nutanix basically collapses all that down into a, a friendly to you form factor. Very easy to deploy, very easy to expand. And you get everything inside this to you box. You get, um, you get your storage, your compute. Um, and also what I like to say is the, we've commoditized the architecture at the factory. Our engineers come from Google and they come from VMware and they come from Oracle and Astro Data, the companies that have the expertise uh, to build these types of solutions so that you can scale and get the benefits of a distributed system um, without having to figure this all out on your own using either open source components or off the shelf technology. And for those of you that are more uh, kinesthetic learners uh, or simply just like server porn, this is what it looks like from the backside. Uh, it's a four node system. So each server is independent. Uh, there is no intelligence in the chassis itself. So this chassis simply is merely a, call it a, a sheet metal wrapper around four physical servers. The only thing that they really share are the dual redundant power supplies. On the front side, of course, you have all the spindles and the flash is integrated on the PCI bus for performance. Each comes with their own separate I.O. They have two gigabit uh, Ethernet ports, one 10 gigabit Ethernet port for high throughput um, storage traffic, and then out of band management uh, for lights out. Now, uh, I was given the 10 minute warning, so I'll see if I can kind of brush through the, the nuts and bolts of how our product works underneath the hood. So I'm gonna take you to Nutanix University, so put on your cap and gown and uh, go through uh, all the various levels of the curriculum. So platform 101, this is what it used to look like or what it looks like today, or at least in a couple years from now, this is what we'll talk about how it used to look like. Uh, guest. So what happens with a guest VM, right? A guest VM has multiple virtualized components. It's designed to represent all the, the physical attributes of a, a server in virtualized space. And in, in this, for this discussion, the virtualized SCSI controller is the most interesting component because any time an I.O. request is submitted by the application, it has to hit the operating system. The operating system talks to the virtualized uh, storage controller on the VM. Now, once that transaction has been submitted to the virtualized SCSI controller, it's picked up by the hypervisor, in this case VMware, and then VMware will take all the I.O.s from all the various uh, VMs and applications sitting on that same host and serialize them so that they're all ordered in the correct fashion to support this multi-tenant model. And that's what the hypervisor is for. It's for scheduling and serialization of transactions so that you don't get corruption on the physical devices. Now, with VMware, of course, um, it doesn't just land on the local storage because most organizations have become addicted to those live migration features, VM mobility, the ability to move VMs between hosts. The only way that can be achieved is through today at least, external shared storage. So from the hypervisor, the hypervisor then submits that transaction down to what uh, HBAs if you're using fiber channel or a NIC if uh, you standardize on iSCSI or NFS down all the way to the SAN. So let's go to platform 202. Now, platform 202, I'm sorry, 102. Yep. There was this uh, trend a couple of years ago, um, mostly sparked by companies like Left Hand and now even in VMware, to virtualize the local storage so that you can present it as shared storage to the rest of the vSphere uh, infrastructure. And it was a rather clever idea because ultimately most of these servers were designed to house spindles and so it seemed somewhat of a waste uh, to uh, have those servers sitting there with empty spindle bays. Um, those spindles could be certainly used for good, for good uh, use. And the way it worked was essentially transactions would, IO transactions would hit the hypervisor as they would um, in the previous model. Except in this case, rather than going down to a physical HPA, uh, the hypervisor would take those IO requests, serialize them and pass them off to uh, the iSCSI or NFS client and then hand that off to a virtualized storage controller which then essentially presented a VMFS volume. 
But the challenge here is that it wasn't just one VMS, VMFS volume it had to go through. In order to hit physical disk, it actually had to go through two layers of uh, VMFS. So that introduced a, a significant amount of overhead. Anytime you go through double abstraction, you're basically not just getting double the performance hit, you're almost getting an exponential increase in performance degradation. So these technologies were sort of interesting science experiments, but could rarely deliver more than a few hundred IOPS. So platform 201, a smarter design for virtualized storage appliance. This is where Nutanix comes into play. In fact, we don't even call it a VSA because we don't want to be associated to that sort of those mistakes of the past. What we do instead is we have a direct data path, data path down to the local storage. So every time IO transactions hit the hypervisor, the hypervisor will hand that IO transaction off to the controller VM, but the controller VM is plugged directly into those physical devices, completely bypassing or puncturing its way through the hypervisor. No abstraction whatsoever. And that gives us great performance. We can go from hundreds of IOs from the VSA model to thousands per physical node. And that just continues to aggregate as you add more and more nodes. So every vSphere host cumulatively adds more storage throughput for your platform. And so a few people typically ask, well, how do you do that? Well, it's very simple. VMware provides several APIs and interfaces to expose these physical devices into a VM without having to go through any abstraction layer. And for spindle-based drives, we're using the raw device mapping feature. For Fusion I.O., because it's a PCI device, it's not, a, it's not a, uh, uh, what you would consider to be a mass storage device sitting on, hanging off of a SAS or SATA controller. We actually take advantage of a, a little known API called VM Direct Path I.O., which allows us to directly pass through that PCI device into the controller VM. So that's what gives us amazing performance, unlike any other VSA product you've heard of. And not to mention the fact that we have uh, infinite scale capabilities. So when you look at this from a cluster point of view, um, this system sort of expands linearly. As you add more and more ESX servers, you create an ever larger and larger global namespace for your iSCSI or NFS export. Uh, and it's a masterless cluster service. That means there's no single master. Um, it's not dependent on any single node. Uh, any node can go offline, and we can still present the data to any uh, physical ESX server. So this gets a little bit more technical. Um, as guests write to disk, um, because we've dispatched controller VMs to every single physical host in the cluster, the I.O. writes and reads are absorbed at the point of origin. And I'm getting the, I'm almost done. Can I get one more minute? Just one more minute? All right, great. Uh, are, are absorbed by the local controller VM and delivered to the storage devices at uh, bus speeds. Now on the back end, we gracefully replicate um, to support some of the advanced features for uh, things like vMotion, fault tolerance, HA. And that's how we uh, get around the problem of dealing with just the storage being on local devices. We make sure that there are copies available on other physical nodes. Now, for read, it's purely just a read from a local device. So you get the, the latency advantages of reading directly off of a PCI flashcard. So we have amazing performance, not only for that single VM, but imagine every VM, or you have VMs on every single node, and they're all reading from their devices. They're not having to go through one central warehouse or one central traffic cop to talk to disk, which has historically been the biggest problem for uh, virtualized workloads, not to mention desktops, which tend to be very randomized. So if you look at vMotion DRS, same thing. Since all controllers have access to the distributed metadata service, um, they're all aware of where the primary blocks are. So as after a VM has moved, um, they can reach across the network and talk to those primary pieces of data, but then eventually move them over to the, the local data store to benefit from the direct data path. So we're constantly monitoring and shaping and swarming the data to the correct locations to be proximity aware. And then uh, for the circumstance when uh, an HA event occurs and the server is offline unexpectedly, uh, server, you know, server goes down, power failure, because we have copies of the data, and our controller VMs are intelligent and aware of all the secondary copies, those VMs can restart as they normally would with, an H with uh, any HA uh, event and bring that VM back up because the secondary copies are also available to every controller VM in the cluster. So I think I could probably wrap it up right here because this is pretty much the conclusion of my uh, part of the presentation. So really the real problem is, is this, this notion of everything converging into one place. It's actually the wrong way of thinking of how to solve that problem. Um, it's all about bringing storage back to the host, right? Putting it where it belongs on the local PCI bus, 
bus and then using intelligent software to make sure that that data is always highly available to all your applications, whether it's VDI, private cloud, or big data. So with that, um, I'll conclude my portion of the presentation, and if there are any questions, we'll be happy to answer them.